Hello, everybody. This is week three. It's the summer. Um, I'm out. I have a scratchy throat today, so I don't know how my voice is going to hold up, but this is our uh, CVPP lab for the week, and it's how to take the carotid pulse, how to take blood pressure, which you, hopefully you know by now, and the oscillatory gap you're usually a little shaky on. And we're going to talk about the difference between first diastole and second diastole. Do you know what that even is? So that's definitely bored stuff right there. So here we go. All right, let's talk about the carotid arteries first. And before we start any exam, you should always get informed consent. Always tell the patient what you're going to do. and You don't have to be super detailed about it and get their okie dokie. Uh, you're going to be on the well, you'll be in front of the patient mainly for blood pressure in these exams. Try to maybe hover more on the right side. Uh, let's do our, remember the anatomy of uh, the carotid arteries. Remember on the right side it's a little different than the left. On the right side we have a brachiocephalic trunk coming off the aortic arch. That splits into the subclavian, the right subclavian. And this would be the right common carotid. Remember, on the left side, the common carotid comes directly off the, the aortic arch. So that's a weird anatomy-type question. Uh, and then right about at the level of the Adam's apple or the laryngeal prominence, uh, you have this very sensitive area right here um, that's at the root of the internal carotid artery. Um, and this contains all sorts of blood pressure sensing equipment right here, uh, which relays information via the nerve of herring, cranial nerve 9, to the vasomotor center. We want to avoid pushing on that. Uh, so we'll talk about that a little bit more um, in a little bit. All right, then the external carotid artery that doesn't go into the skull. The internal carotid artery goes inside the skull and it goes up and supplies the circle of Willis and you know all that stuff. All right, vertebral artery is there. I think that's all we need to know. Now in pathology, they don't differentiate really between a internal carotid artery and external carotid artery pulse. They, they're just going to, and they don't say a common carotid artery. They're not that anatomically correct. They just say the carotid artery. So that's kind of all of this stuff here. Okay, um, so how do you take the carotid pulse? Uh, very easy and safe to do this. There's three places you can get it. There's two safe places you can get it. There's one right above the clavicle where you can place the little rabbit ears. Remember, we've been talking about taking pulses with the two little rabbit ears, uh, the index and middle finger, kind of curve them a little bit. Um, so this is the preferred place to take it, even though this is the hardest place, I think, to take it. Uh, you just curve your fingers, and the SCM muscle will be right here. So you kind of push that out of the way and sink your fingers in. And that's the carotid pulse right there. If you can't find it there, follow the SCM muscle up. Slide your fingers all the way up to the mandible until this finger bumps into the mandible. And, and that's the second place. That's by far the easiest place to take the pulse. Right At last ditch effort, you can take it in the middle here, but laryngeal prominence is right here. So maybe 1% of your patients might get a little bit dizzy. Maybe if up to 5% might get a little dizzy if you push into that, right? Because that may drop blood pressure. So stay off that, uh, out of that area. Of course, that's called the carotid. Did I mention that? That's the carotid sinus right here. That's the carotid sinus at the root of the internal carotid artery. Okay, so stay off that thing. Uh, this is CETL, which is one of the chiropractic board books. So CETL allows to take it up here with this finger bumping into the mandible. This is, again, by far the easiest place. Stay off this area right here. The SCM would be right in here. Stay off this area where the, where the laryngeal prominence or the Adam's apple is because a patient could, they could even faint and hit their head. It's not going to kill the patient, but it, it's the danger of fainting and hitting their head. Why do you palpate the carotid pulse? What information can we glean from that structure? 
Well, just like any pulse, we can get rate, rhythm, and amplitude. So we can we can check the uh, the strength of the the pulsation of blood Let's see if the heart is pumping normally you should have a normal pulsation there probably stronger here than in the radial artery because it's closer to the heart itself um, is the pulse irregular which could indicate palpitations premature atrial contractions premature ventral contractions uh, pjc's premature junctional contractions can all make the heart skip beats or maybe the pulse is really, really weak because they have a failing heart. Or maybe they have aortic stenosis and the blood just can't get out. Or maybe they have aortic regurgitation and you get a crazy strong pulse that pulse that disappears really quickly and almost sinks the skin in. Remember we talked about the corrugator pulse or the water hammer pulse is always suggestive of aortic regurgitation. Um, yeah, so it could be all those. Maybe there's a beaver dam in the carotid artery, too. That's possible. Uh, and you might feel, remember we talked about a purring cat? Purring cat is a thrill, a sign of turbulent blood flow. So we're looking for all these things. And maybe it's coarctation of the aorta. Maybe it's super, super strong. And then your lower extremity pulses are super, super weak. That's really rare, though. All right, here's a thrill again. Remember, uh, turbulent blood flow palpates as a cat purring on your fingertips. Remember, we can check that. We can follow that up by auscultating with the bell. And, and what's that called? No, that's not a thrill. If it's a turbulent blood flow oscillatory sound, which which sounds like a whoosh, 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 like a whooshing of blood during systole. Yes, that's called a brewy. It's not called a brew it. Brew it. It's a brewy. It's the way that's pronounced. Okay. So any upstream beaver dam uh, could palpate uh, with a thrill. For example, let's go back to this. So what if you have a piece of thrombus right here? Or maybe you have atherosclerosis, and this is really beaver dammed right in this area. Um, and you're, you're palpating right here because you can't find a pulse up here or you can't find one down here. So you're palpating in this middle area where you're not supposed to be palpating, only a last-ditch effort. But you might feel a whoosh of blood because the beaver dam is right here. Remember, it's like putting your finger over a hose and all the, vo all the volume of blood is decreased. You get a whooshing of blood that's coming out of that uh, finger on the hose type thing there. See how that works? All right, that's called a thrill. After you've palpated the for the crowded pulse, uh, now we're going to auscultate it. So breweries, we're auscultating for breweries. That's the only reason we're auscultating the carotid artery. Uh, and we're going to go in all three of these places. And you can go over the carotid sinus here or at the laryngeal prominence here. Um, and it doesn't matter what order you go in, but remember to stay medial to the SCM muscle. SCM muscle would be like right here. Let me see, just an experiment. Let me see if I can, my drawing tools will work. I'm just curious. So SCM muscle, yeah, they do work. Would be like right in here. Okay, then it's got right two connections, clavicular head and the sternal head. That's the sternocleidomastoid mastoid muscle. So we're palpating, or we're auscultating, um, and this, it looks like she's auscultating in the middle, but the, the bell hasn't moved yet, so you can put the bell right here. 1001, 1002, 1003, listening for whoosh, 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 listening for brewery, auscultating here. And again, you can go either direction, auscultating here. See how that works? All right. Now I have to close this without exiting out of the program. There we go. Should be okay. All right. Oh, and let's finish this off. So you always classically use the bell because breweries are usually low pitch. Severe stenosis or severe beaver dam, it might make the 
uh, the pitch higher than normal. Um, so, or I'm sorry, the severe stenosis may make the pitch lower than normal. That's why we use the bell to check for severe stenosis. Uh, but the diaphragm, Bates recommends using the diaphragm because most breweries tend to be higher in pitch. But the severe ones will be low in pitch. So you'll, if you use the diaphragm, you could miss the most deadly breweries. Bottom line, you should use both. And it takes, what, uh, nine seconds? 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, move. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003. Then repeat with a diaphragm. So make sure you auscultate with both. Got it? Okay. Um, everything we said, uh, the upper, middle, and lower uh, carotid artery should be auscultated. Also, a key note here when you're doing this, make sure the patient holds their breath. Otherwise, you'll hear, hear the tracheal breath sounds, which are crazy high in pitch, and they will obscure breweries. So make sure the patient holds their breath while you do this procedure. Um, so what do you do? What if you find a whoosh, whoosh, whoosh? And then you palpate it and you even feel a purring cat. I would refer the patient to the emergency room just to be safe. Uh, they may have a giant uh, piece of plaque about ready to break loose. Maybe breaching phenomenon is about to occur. Uh, you learned that in your uh, atherosclerosis pathophysiology. Remember, breaching is the last stage of an atheroma or an atherosclerotic plaque, and that can break loose and flow downstream and the patient can have a stroke. So if I heard if I heard one of these just to be safe and protect that expensive license of yours against lawsuit, I would immediately refer to the emergency room and let them deal with it. Obviously, if you're a chiropractor, um, you should always auscultate and palpate the carotid arteries prior to any manipulation in my book, especially in older people. If you find a brewery, uh, it's Spinal manipulation of any kind is contraindicated. Carotid uh, sinus massage for someone having atrial fibrillation is always contraindicated for chiropractors as well. Uh, it could put the patient into a ventricular fibrillation or ventricular flutter. It's rare, but there's a New England Journal of Medicine article about that. So stay off that carotid sinus. All right, enough about the carotid arteries. Let's go to blood pressure. You guys are pretty good about this already because you're going to get tested on it on Friday. But it's a measure of the force that the blood pressure imparts upon the blood vessel walls after it's ejected from the heart. The highest force during uh, when the heart squeezes and contracts, that's called systole, that's systolic pressure. When the heart relaxes and goes into di diastole, that's called diastolic pressure. Let me grab a little water here. What is hypertension? So you had to learn all those guidelines about the different stages of hypertension. What do the board books say hypertension is? Thank goodness they keep it nice and simple. Bates, Seidel, Rubens, and Robbins all say the definition, those are all board books, the definition of hypertension is anything systole wise anything 140 or above uh, and diastole wise 90 or above so if you hit either one of these if the patient's blood pressure is 140 over 80 they have hypertension specifically they have systolic hypertension if the patient's blood pressure is 90 over 120 they still have hypertension they have diastolic hypertension specifically See how that works? Um, here's a referral to the hospital emergency. Uh, this is a medical emergency. If they have malignant hypertension, if systole gets to 180, so if their blood pressure is 180 over 85, that's a medical emergency. They go to the hospital, go to the emergency room. Or on the other side of the coin, maybe their blood pressure is 120 over 120, which is not going to happen, but... Um, that's a medical emergency. So either if either one of those numbers hits, medical emergency, that's malignant hypertension. Hypotension is an arm pressure less than 90 over one, or over 60. So if, if the blood pressure is 90 over 70, that's hypotension. 
If their blood pressure is 120 over 60, that's hypotension. A lot of people have blood pressure that low. This one is not as alarming. And it's to make the diagnosis, it's really based more on symptoms. They'll have trouble standing up fast. They'll get really dizzy. But there are some heart arrhythmias that can cause this as well. Uh, confounders, do you know that? That's a vocabulary word if you don't know that already. That is things that mess up the true blood pressure of a patient. Those are confounders. Things that mess up the results of a study, interfere with, make false positives or false negatives. Those are confounders. So the white coat effect you've probably heard of, uh, but about 20% of people get nervous around doctors to the point that it's going to artificially elevate their blood pressure when they go into the office. Therefore, physicians uh, should not just put people on blood pressure medication because maybe they're under this effect. They should always send the patient home with a blood pressure monitoring unit, which you can buy on Amazon uh, and see what it, it is at home. Just don't throw somebody on blood pressure medication, which somebody tried to do uh, to me a long time ago, and I just laughed. I never went back to the doctor. I said, what a, you know, that's not very smart because I don't have hypertension. I had just eaten three Big Macs and had fries and uh, went to a cardiology appointment. My pressure was up because of all the salt and all the stuff. And anyway, um, so you guys know this one. That's the white coat effect. You usually don't know this one. So another 20% of the population, when they go to a doctor's office, they actually feel very safe. Uh, they feel like, God, if something happens to me, we have a doctor right here, I am safe. So they have a blood pressure that is artificially lower than normal to some degrees. Um, there's interesting research on this group of patients. They have an increased risk for cardiovascular disease and end organ uh, disease as well. So this, this group has to be watched out for here. Um, so uh, probably a good idea if you go to the doctor's office and you have abnormal blood pressure, uh, it's good to have a home blood pressure kit. You get over 40, over 50, it's good to have a home blood pressure unit and just kind of keep an eye on your pressure. It's the silent killer, right? It can destroy, it causes atherosclerosis, which is the root of heart attacks and stroke. Uh, what may increase blood pressure? I like this slide. Could I even put more stars on it? Uh, well, arterial stenosis, right? We said the arterioles are the most important member of the circulatory system that controls blood pressure. If they are artificially closed where the lumen is too narrow, the heart has to muscle up to push blood into the capillaries. Remember, we said the capillaries are very finicky about the pressure and the the body will go to great lengths to make sure capillaries have the proper blood pressure. So anything that, that gunks up the, uh, the arterioles. Uh, so atherosclerosis, uh, peripheral arterial disease, compressive tumor, uh, stress, is that in here somewhere? Increased sympathetic outflow. Uh, well, also from stress, some people just are wired like that. They, if you have too much sympathetic flow, it compresses or causes a more constriction of the tunica media of the blood vessel and narrows the lumen. And therefore, you have a narrow pipe. You're going to have increased blood pressure. Uh, maybe you have renal artery stenosis and one of your kidneys is releasing renin, which stimulates the R2A system and angiotensin II uh, is going to raise the blood pressure via many mechanisms. Um, hyperaldosteronism, these are, that's rare. These are rare conditions, but if you have too much aldosterone, it causes the reabsorption of salt and water from the filtrate, which is going to raise your blood pressure. Um, and we've talked about arterial compliance. Uh, many times I've talked about the ascending aorta, how it stretches when blood is blasted out of the heart. Not only does that stretch lead to a contraction of the artery during, during diastole, where blood is forced back into the heart and closes the semilunar valves. Um, but that stretching of the ascending aorta dissipates that big blast of blood coming out of the heart during systole. And that decreases blood pressure. 
If that is nice and stiff, there's nothing to take the energy of that blast of blood coming out of the left heart, and you're going to have hypertension from that. What causes stiffness, old age, where you get arterial sclerosis of some kind? Uh, and we talked about the three types of art arterial sclerosis, atherosclerosis, arteriolosclerosis, and Munkberg's medial sclerosis are all different forms of stiffening of the arteries. How do you take a blood pressure? You guys know how to do this. Here's a link again to make sure you watch the, this so you know how to do this. Now, I, I differ from the way you were taught to take blood pressure. Um, you're taking it out of, con the, way you've, you're, the way you take it is a one-step procedure, and they do that for convenience. But if, if I were taking the boards, I would do it exactly the way the board books say. So Bates and Seidel and even Jarvis say this is a two-step procedure, not a one-step procedure to stay, save time. This two-step procedure is more accurate. It's been proven. That's why it's this two-step procedure. The way you guys are doing it uh, could give you an artificial uh, reading of blood pressure. So it's basically the same procedure, but you need to rest in between finding the cutoff pressure and the arm pressure. So the goal of any way you take the blood pressure is you have to find the cutoff pressure. What's the cutoff pressure? That's basically going to be systole. Um, that's the pressure when you when you occlude the artery. Uh, remember, you take well, well. We'll go through this, but you take the brachial pulse, and you can feel the pulse, and you pump up the cuff uh, until that pulse disappears. That's the cutoff pressure, and that's going to end up being systole in most cases. But you find a cutoff pressure, and then you find the arm pressure. Let's talk about it. So finding the cutoff pressure, everything I just said, I don't need to repeat that. It'll probably end up being systole. Uh, and why do we, why are we bothered finding this cutoff pressure? Because there's something called an oscillatory gap, uh, which is a silent period right in the middle of all the crock cough sounds. Well, it's actually toward the start of the crock cough sounds. And if you don't pump up high enough, you might accidentally start in an oscillatory gap. And then when you go down and you start making noise, you think that's systole, the first crock cough sound, and it's actually the second or third crock cough sound. I'll explain that more in a second. But yeah, we got to watch out for the oscillatory gap. I guess we can look at it right now. So here is a pressure graph. Okay, here's the... Uh, level of mercury, or the pressure, zero pressure. So when you pump a cuff up, let's pretend we're pumping up our cuff. Pumping, 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 pumping. So we're way up here at 150. And now you put your stethoscope on the artery and you listen. When you start releasing the air out of the cuff, the pressure is going to start dropping in the cuff. You hear nothing because the arm cuff, the tightness around your arm is still great enough to occlude completely beaver dam the brachial artery so you hear nothing but when you get around 120 now the artery and the blood pressure backup is or the blood backup is finally strong enough to start squirting through the brachial artery and you can listen to that that first that first noise is called crack cough one and uh, crack cough one or sometimes it's called phase one uh, runs for about oh, about 15 millimeters of mercury or so. It's defined as a clear, sharp tapping uh, noise. I don't expect you to know that, but uh, Krotkoff 1 runs about 15 millimeters. And then the pitch changes, and you're still listening. Now the pitch changes to more of a swishing, soft sound. Now you're in Krotkoff 2. Uh, then the pitch changes again around 94 millimeters of mercury, and the scientific data here, to a, a clear, like a knocking or a banging sound. And this is a very important noise or change, a sound change. Um, so you get a muffling, a distinct, sudden muffling, normally around 80 millimeters of mercury. Um, and that is the start of Krotkoff 4. 
right? We used to, when I went to school, we used this sudden muffling change as your diastolic number. Um, so therefore, the start of Karat Ka 4 is called first diastole. Okay, so the start of Karat Ka 4, which runs about 12 millimeters of mercury from here to here, um, that's called first diastole. And we used to use that as the lower number in blood pressure. I think in about 1990, they changed that because people didn't understand this and they're messing blood pressure up. And most people were waiting until they heard no noise. That's actually second diastole. After this faint muffling is done and you hear nothing, that's, that's, that's crack cough five. That's also called second diastole, and that's what you guys use uh, to, to formulate their blood pressure. That's your diastolic number. So you should know that your diastolic number is second diastole. Back in the day, a more accurate way to take it is to use first diastole. Okay, so make sure you understand that. All right, so put the cuff around the arm, make sure that the artery marker is in the center over the brachial artery. Should be about one inch. The bottom of the cuff should be about one inch above the cubital crease. That's about two fingers. Uh, the tightness should be also two fingers. You should be able to have the cuff tight enough to slide two fingers in there hardly. You shouldn't be able to put all four fingers in there. Most people make this cuff too loose. I don't think I've ever seen anybody make it too tight. Uh, so make sure it's pretty snug. And now, so we're finding the cutoff pressure. So the first thing we want to do is how high do we have to pump this cuff up to completely occlude the blood flowing through the brachial artery? And remember last lecture, we talked about where the brachial artery is. It's in the crack of the elbow, the cubital crease. And it's if you make have them make a bicep and feel their bicep tendon, it's just medial to the bicep tendon, okay? And we talked all about that last time. It's not up here underneath the cuff, up under the bicep where they used to teach. I think they're getting away from that now, which is great. Only took like five years. Um, but yeah, this is where you find it right here. Remember, if you can't find it, lock the elbow out. Make sure their elbow is that they don't have a problem with their elbow, but gently straighten out their arm and you'll trap the brachial artery underneath the condyle uh, of the humerus, All right? But once you find it, start pumping up. And remember, somewhere around 100, start really being, start pumping little half pumps because between 100 and 140, it's going to disappear. And that's going to be your cutoff pressure. And that's probably going to be uh, that's probably going to be your systolic reading as well. But get ready. So pump, 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 and when, all of a sudden you won't feel pulsation here anymore. That's your cutoff pressure. It's probably going to be systole. Make a note of that. In our example, we're going to say that's 120 disappeared. You can even go up higher. You can pump up a little higher and then drop back down and see if it reappears about 120. You can kind of double test it. Okay. I, I, I was going to say something, but I won't because I think it'll confuse people right now. But let's just leave it at that. So after you find the cutoff pressure, here's the difference between how you learned it and the way all the board books say to do it. Now you need to get, let the patient's arm rest because you've been monkeying around with it here. So let all the air out of the blood pressure cuff. Leave it in place. Take your fingers out, and you got to wait about 30 seconds. Let the blood flow return. Let, they can drop the arm down. Also remember, I forgot to mention, the arm is parallel, uh, or it should be at the level of their heart. So gravity isn't influencing things here. Also, it's nice to, uh, to pinch. I pinch the wrist technique. Um, if you're right-handed, your right hand should be operating the pump uh, and the valve. Your left hand should be held uh, for doing, for taking the pulse and for holding the stethoscope here, right? So always put your right forearm underneath their forearm, the forearm that you're going to be 
taking, and you can always, you can pinch it between your side and their side, but put your forearm underneath their forearm, your right forearm underneath their forearm, whether it be the right or the left. Um, you can all easily lock their elbow out by lifting your forearm up. And then you're looking right through this gap right here at a lot of your, your pumps have the blood pressure cuff dial on them. So you'd be looking right between this gap to watch the pressure. This model, this older model, has the pressure gauge right here. So I'm just looking at it. There, that should be spun around a little bit. It kind of slid a little too far. Would like the, well, I guess it's not that bad, but I would maybe a smidge more of where the artery marker is more here. Uh, but anyway, that's another good technique. Your forearm against their forearm, your dominant hand does does all the delicate work here. All right. <clears throat> yep. Um, did I get everything? Yeah. Yeah, if you if you have the arm dangling down uh, too low, <clears throat> it's going to make your blood pressure a little higher than normal. <clears throat> Sorry, my voice is going. Uh, if it's too high, like if it's way up over your head, your blood pressure is going to be artificially low. Right? There's everything I just said. Again, brachial artery is in the cubital crease. It's right there. It's not up here. It's right there. And the right hand operates the controls. Notice I don't even have my stethoscope. I don't need these in my, don't need in this part, I don't need them. I might have 30 seconds to put these on. It'd probably be a good idea to have them on, but you don't need it because you're going to have 30 seconds to get ready for this. All right. So pump up. Find the cutoff pressure, everything I already explained. Record that number. Now let the air out of the cuff. Remember, that's so part one of the procedure. Finding the cutoff pressure is done. Okay, just another close-up there. All right, so part two, find the arm pressure. So after the blood pressure cuff has been loosened for about 30 seconds, and during that time, get your stethoscope on. Put the earpieces in your ears correctly um, and get ready to go. Uh, get the diaphragm. As, you can use the belt or the diaphragm, but the diaphragm is probably easiest. Get the diaphragm over the brachial artery in the cubital crease uh, and get ready uh, to go. Right? So here I'm ready to go. I'm counting down that 30 seconds. Don't put your fingers on the bell. No thumb on the bell. Put it on the diaphragm like this. Right? Or you can hold it if you want, but keep your fingers off that bell in case their stethoscope mouse functions. You might get an artificial finger pulse through there. So they say, I've experimented with that. I've never been able to, to cause that. I put my thumb on there and fingers on there. I can never find that, but um, that's just, you know, they'll mark you off if you put your finger. That bell should be free and clear. Okay, so part two, the arm is rested. Uh, off we go. Now, there's no more palpation. You know you're going to go 30 millimeters of mercury above your cutoff pressure. Okay, so if your cutoff pressure was 120, you already know you're going to pump up to 150. And honestly, you should pump up 50 millimeters of mercury because there's newer research that shows oscillatory gaps can be up to 45 millimeters of, of mercury. So you would miss it. Uh, but the classic answer is 20 to 30 millimeters above whatever the cutoff pressure was. I say go 30 uh, and really go f go 50. You ever go to the, the real doctor's office? Did they ever do this, all this cutoff stuff? No. They just, they just set up and they pump up to about 200 just to make sure they don't miss an oscillatory gap, which can be a little uncomfortable. Uh, but it's, I mean, that's the way it is in the real world. This is just kind of a testing type thing. But anyway, um, so we know the cutoff pressure was 120. We know we're going to go to 150. So off you go. Squeeze your hand. Pump, 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 pump. Um, as fast as you can. Get up to uh, 150. And then slowly let the air out. Turn the valve. Okay, let me catch up with my slides here. So... Go 30 millimeters above the cutoff pressure. Everything I said, slowly let the air out and watch the needle go down. How fast does the needle go down? 
So it's about three to four bounces for every 10 millimeters. Okay, uh, most of blood pressure, most of these blood pressure units, you can actually watch the needle bounce as you go down. So let's dial, let's do a uh, needle right here. Okay, so this is 120, this is 110, this is 100, 30, 40, 50. So you're up here at 50, right? So the needle is here at 150, All right? So the needle is going to bounce one or three to four times, and then you should be down 10 millimeters of mercury. It's going to bounce another 10 times. And I mean bounce. You know what I mean if you've done this. The needle can bounce. Uh, so it'll bounce another three or four times. And now you'll be down at 130. And it'll, you see how that works? And then, and then it'll repeat. So about three to four bounces for every 10 millimeters of mercury. Um, some blood pressure kits, you don't, you don't have a... You don't have a bounce. Let me carefully get rid of that. Um, in those cases, you can count 1,001, 1,002, 1,003. The needle should have went down 10 millimeters of mercury. All right, so that speed is very important, and it changes. When you get down to the lower numbers, the needle slows down, and you have to let a little more air out. You want a steady drop. Okay, so what are you listening for? Well, if, you're, if, if they're normal and the cutoff pressure said uh, their systole was at 120, from 150 down to 120, you're not going to hear anything. It should be silent. And then around 120, you should hear the first boom. And that's Karotkov 1. You enter the Karotkov 1 zone. And then you keep listening to all those changes. And you don't need to know all those changes. But you should know that muffling sound where, where the first diastole is. That's Karotkov 4, right? So we explained this. I've already explained all this stuff. So systole is the start of Karotkov 1 or phase 1. Diastole for you guys is the start of Karotkov 5. You should memorize that. The diastole you use is also second diastole. Got it? So make sure you know the difference between them. And here's this thing again. I'm not going to go over this again. We already did this. But here you started, you pumped way up to 150, and you started letting the pressure out three, uh, three to four bounces per every 10 millimeters. And with the first noise you hear, that's your systole. It's 120, so you have to memor memorize 120. And then you keep letting it out, and it goes lower and lower, and you hear... You're hearing a sound and it's changing. The sound is changing. But when it muffles like crazy, um, that's first diastole. That's what I used to use again. That's also the start of Krotkoff 4. And when you finally hear the last audible sound, you've just went into the silent Krotkoff 5. That point where you hear nothing, the last sound, that is second diastole or, or the beginning of Krotkoff 5. Okay, make sure you understand this stuff. And there's just a, um, another description of it. All right, now, why do we care about all this stuff? Because there's a phenomenon that happens more in people with hypertension, and it's called the oscillatory gap. And it's a weird, silent period that typically shows up in the first Karotkov zone or the second Karotkov zone. And researchers are not sure. They debate. It seems like every year there's a different theory on what causes the silent period. And it's only with the blood pressure cuff and stethoscope. It's an, it's an oscillatory phenomenon. The blood pressure machines, they don't, they don't get fooled by this, by this oscillatory gap. How come? Because they pump up to about 200 or so. So it takes that right out of the play. Okay. Um, but the scary thing about it is it's seen in people with dangerously high hypertension, moderate to severe hypertension. 
And st some studies show it could be up to 50, 45 to 50 millimeters in mercury. So it can be really huge. So let's look at how this works. So let, here's the same uh, sound graft reading. And here's a patient with hypertension whose real systolic number is 160. That's high. That's, that's significant hypertension. But they also have this weird oscillatory gap that runs from about 150 to 125 or so. This is silent. If you pump up your blood pressure cuff to, let's say, 140 or even 150, when you, and you start listening and you let the air out and you start listening, it'll be quiet. Right? Quiet, quiet, quiet. And the first noise you hear, boom, you'll think that's cough one down around 125 or so. But it's not, here's the catch, and here's the danger of an oscillatory gap. That's not really Karotkoff 1. It's Karotkoff 2. If you would have pumped up to about 180 or 200 and come down, it would be silent, 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 and then you'd hear, boom, 160. But then strangely, again, about 150 or so, it would go quiet. So this is silent period is the oscillatory gap, and we're not 100% sure what causes it, but we are sure that it's uh, seen in people with significantly high blood pressure. So you got to watch out for that oscillatory gap. Does everybody understand that? I guarantee you I'm going to ask you questions about this oscillatory gap, first diastoline, second diastoline. Got it? Okay. Um, some fun facts about the oscillatory gap. It's found in about 5% of the general population. Um, and a couple really well done studies, classic studies, found in 21% of people with hypertension. A lot of these people with hypertension, they didn't know they had hypertension for years because the, the, uh, the medical assistants wouldn't pump up high enough to catch it. You know, they were pumping up to 140 or 150. So they thought the patient's blood pressure, they'd write down on the chart, the blood pressure is 125 or the systole is 125. When really it was 160. This can go on for years and years until somebody catches it. So watch out for that oscillatory gap. Again, these blood pressure cuffs, which are fairly accurate, um, they, don't, they use a different method for calculating pressure, and they always go up to 200 or so. So they're not going to monkey with the, the oscillatory gap, right? Um, they're going to pump way up to here, 200, and then they'll let the air out so they won't miss it. They don't monkey around with this, this um, you know, finding the cutoff pressure, and then, uh, yeah, they just they don't miss it because they go up so high. All right, so that's it. Uh, now go watch my demo video on how to do this if you need it. Sorry you couldn't be there today, um, but hopefully I will see you tomorrow. See you later.